Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. So um, I hope you've enjoyed the two videos I've uploaded so far. And so next on our kind of journey through decision making is recognizing assumptions. And what I've done is I've divided recognizing assumption into two parts. So what I've called clause questions and non-clause questions. So today's video will specifically explore clause questions. Um, and then we will go on to non-clause questions next time, which are similar but slightly different um, in terms of how to best answer them. So just some kind of first starting introductory ideas. So recognising assumption questions are easy to do if you know what to do and what to look out for. And they're quick as well, which is what's important. In decision making, if you think about it, you have 37 minutes for 35 questions, which leaves you at around one minute, two seconds on average per question. But recognising assumption questions, you can definitely do a lot faster. And some of the other ones do take a little bit longer. So therefore, by clawing time from recognising assumptions, you can divert it towards the more important two mark questions, for example, which is why it's really, really important to understand how to do these properly. The idea with clause questions is that they are different from a regular question. So a regular question, so think about it this way. So if I go into a car dealership, a regular question might be if I walked into the car dealership and I say, should I buy this car to the kind of salesman? A clause question basically says, should I buy this car because it has good mileage? Okay, so it, it talks about a topic of interest. And so therefore, for a question for like that, I would want an answer that answers my question. Okay, so I would want the salesman to say yes, because it has the best miles per gallon compared to any other car that we sell or compared to any other cars in the market. I wouldn't want the salesman to tell me yes, because it's a cool color, right? That might be true, but it's not relevant to my question. So with clause questions, it's important to understand why the question or statement is being asked and what we can kind of get from it. I will explain and I'll do a walkthrough of this. But before that, it's really important, I think, to learn some of the common red flags. Because, and if I just jump ahead to point five, because one of the key ways to do recognising assumptions is to often eliminate answers as opposed to directly choosing the correct answer immediately. OK, so the reason being is often it can be quite hard to pick out the correct answer from option of options of four, like when they're isolated. Sometimes it's better to be like it can't be A, it can't be C, it can't be D. B looks OK and it can't be the others. So therefore, I'm going with B. OK, so it's important to learn some of the common red flags so you can get to ruling out questions a lot faster. So one of the ways in which you can do this is um, generic statements. So they're a common red flag. So what I mean by that is when they make assumptions. So when they say things like oh, no one would do this, no one would do that, because those are blanket statements, which is not necessarily true. OK. It's also important to um, think about potentially combining keywords and clauses. So what I mean by that is, so sometimes in answers, there may be two answers that actually answer the clause, but only one of them has the right keywords. OK, um, just something to think about. I, none of the, the questions that I'm going to go with, through with you today have that kind of idea, but that could be true. So, for example, if one of the questions was, um, so should children be restricted from using social media? to protect their well-being. There could be two answers that talk about well-being, but only one of them may talk about children, while the other one potentially talks about adults. OK, so therefore it will, it, the answer would be the one that talks about well-being and is also about children. OK, so kind of combining both. But normally, just by choosing the clause question, you can get to the answer. OK, cool. So let's talk you through the first recognising assumption question. And so what do I actually mean by clauses? So all a clause is, is like I said, it, it gives direction to a question. So here, have a read of this question. Should the maximum speed limit on motorways be reduced to improve road safety? So the to improve road safety is the clause because it gives you a direction. The main part of the question is, should the maximum speed limit on motorways be reduced? But to improve road safety talks about why this question has been asked, essentially. And you can check if you've got your clause right by often removing it and the rest of the question should still make sense. So here it does. So what we are basically looking for is we are looking for an answer and we're not looking for an answer that talks about improving road safety. We're talking looking for an answer that talks about road safety. OK, so A says, yes, reducing the speed limit will cut harmful emissions. So A is wrong. And the reason why it's wrong is, like, like I said once again, let's go back to our car dealership scenario. Imagine I walk in and I say to the salesman, should I buy this car because it's efficient? And he tells me, yes, it's a really fast car. OK, like that's cool, 
but it's not exactly what I want as an answer. That's not what I'm looking for. Do you see? That's the kind of idea, essentially. Okay, let's have a look at B. B says, no, the accident rate at lower speed limits is no different to that at higher speed limits. So it could be B because it talks about road safety because it talks about the accident rate. So let's move on from that. So let's have a look at the other options. C says, it's difficult to stop drivers ignoring the present speed limit. A new speed limit will be ignored in the same way. OK, so it's not C because once again, while it may raise a valid point about the practical implica implications of implementing it, it's not relevant to road safety. And D is wrong because it just makes a generic statement. It says the real problem is slow drivers. It'll be better to have a minimum speed limit. If it said the real problem is slow drivers, they cause 95% of crashes, then that would be fair. Do you see? But this is just a generic statement. It doesn't have any meaning behind it. So therefore, our answer is B. Just a couple of things I want to highlight. Clauses don't always have to be at the end of questions. They can be in the middle. They can be at the start. And also, there can be multiple clauses. And if that's the case, then you just need to select an answer that talks about all of them, not just one. OK? So, perhaps if you'd like to have a go at this one, uh, at this question, you can pause the video now, and then I will go through it once you've come up with an answer. Just a quick hint, there are there is more than one clause here. So just watch out for that. OK, so let's go through this. So hopefully you may have identified that the clauses are here. So to reduce costs, increase accuracy and improve turnout. And importantly, we're not looking at reducing costs, increasing accuracy and improving turnout. We're looking for an answer that mentions costs, accuracy and turnout. And once again, we know this is the right answer. This is the right clause because if you remove it, the rest of the question still makes sense. So should voting in elections be undertaken online or exceptionally by post? That still makes sense. OK, so let's go through the options. So A says, yes, online or postal voting will be more convenient for voters and will therefore be more likely to improve, will therefore be likely to improve overall turnout. So this is wrong because it only talks about one third. It only talks about the turnout idea. OK, that's fine. But like I said, normally there will be an answer that talks about everything. B says, electronic voting and counting would provide results more rapidly and with less chance of error than present counting methods. Once again, it only talks about one third of it, less chance of it. So it only talks about the accuracy idea. So that's wrong as well. Let's have a look at C. C says the necessary equipment will be expensive to buy. Electronic voting would discourage some from voting and hackers might well interfere with the result. So it talks about cost, talks about accuracy and it talks about turnout. So therefore it talks about all three of the ideas. And so therefore, it's very likely that this is going to be our answer. D is going to be one of those blanket kind of things. So it says no such innovations will be changed for the sake of change. The voting and counting systems work effectively at present, so there's no need to change them. And this is another one of those kind of red flags, I guess, is when it says, oh, the status quo is fine. When it says everything's fine as it is, that's going to be normally another one of those like red flags, because as I said, it doesn't mention these kind of ideas. It doesn't mention the clauses. So you can see here, the clauses are at the start. There were three of them, and our answer answered all of them. OK? Just one thing to watch out for, as you can see. So normally when it says to do something, that's normally like a good giveaway of a clause, but it doesn't always have to be the case. OK? Um, so just watch out for that. OK, so what about this question? Once again, pause the video, have a go at it. Perhaps you can, you can um, see if you can identify the clause, first of all, and then try to logically and methodically rule out your answers and get to the answer. So, would it strengthen the idea of marriage if as a means of promoting the longevity of marriages or possibility of getting a divorce was removed? Okay, so here the clause is this middle bit here, as a means of promoting the longevity of marriages. Remember I said you don't necessarily always need to have two to be able to answer this question, uh, to, to have a clause. So here it's the as a means of promoting longevity of marriages. And if you get rid of that part, the rest of the question still makes sense. The important idea here is not promoting longevity, but it's like I said, it's the longevity of marriages, because of course you can disagree with it. Let's go through our options. So I'm just going to jump down to C and D immediately, and we can rule out both of those for the same reason, which is the idea that they're blanket statements. So first of all, they're blanket statements, because it says no one would consider getting married in the first place, no one contemplates the possibility of getting divorced on the day they get married. So first of all, how do you know that? You, you, can't, you can't make that assumption. Secondly, they're also wrong because obviously they don't talk about, importantly, the longevity of marriages. So I guess the second reason is more important than the first. But as I said, because elimination is often more helpful for us, it can be very useful for us to, to find these methods. 
Okay, so find these red flags to help you rule out answers more easily. So between A and B, A says people would take time to get to know each other and not rush into marriage. So this talks about what happens before marriage. Do you see? It doesn't talk about the longevity of marriages. Only B is the right answer because it says married couples would work harder to keep their marriage happy. So even though you may not personally agree with the answer, this is the only one that talks about the longevity. So the answer is B. And that raises another important point, which is the idea that you have to be very, very objective when dealing with these answers. Okay, You're not allowed to bring in any of your personal views or opinions. Just simply select from the information they've given you and the clauses they've given you. Okay, on to the last question then. So once again, pause it, have a go and see what you get. So in a multicultural society, should religious symbols on funeral monuments be banned from public cemeteries to avoid offending visitors of other or no faith? So mistakenly, some people sometimes use this as the clause, but that doesn't really make any sense in a multicultural society. It doesn't really give us any direction for the question. In fact, the actual clause is down here, to avoid offending visitors of other or no faith. And so the question is, in a multicultural society, should religious symbols on funeral monuments be banned from public cemeteries? So remember, we're talking about something to do with offending visitors, that kind of idea. So if we just kind of quickly flick between the answers, you can immediately see that B is going to be wrong because it talks about aesthetics. B says it's much better when you go into a cemetery and see plain lawns without monuments, which simply clutter up the space and look confusing and untidy. C says it would be better if every if each different religion had its own cemetery, so they would not need religious symbols as everyone would easily know the person's religion. C is also wrong because it's, nev it's not about knowing someone's religion. It's about offensiveness, something about offending visitors. It's not about knowing someone's religion. Okay, so then it's between A and D. Mistakenly, a lot of people put A as the answer because they, they see the offending visitors and they see upset and they think, oh, this has got to be the answer. But if you read it, it says cemeteries are community spaces and anyone should be able to visit them when they want without the upset of having religion forced on them. So the first bit of the sentence starts OK, but then it pulls in too much of an uh, too much. Uh, it takes it too far. So it's, it talks about having religion forced on them. But that's not the idea here. It's simply just a symbol on a monument. OK, so it it takes it too far. And so for that reason, it can't be A. So we're left with D, and D is the answer because if you read, it says, no, death is a very important event and families ought to, to be able to commemorate someone's faith tastefully without being restricted by the intolerance of others. So it talks about the offensiveness side and it says, you know what, you should be a little bit more tolerant. And it says, no, this is wrong because you're being intolerant, essentially. Okay? So hopefully um, that was easy enough to be able to understand and hopefully now you should have no problem with these kind of clause questions so in the next kind of installation of recognizing assumptions we'll talk about these non-clause questions which can be potentially a slightly bit trickier but once again i think using the idea of elimination remember it's often easier to eliminate answers and get to our main answer than it is to just simply pick it out then we should hopefully be fine so hopefully this was useful. And once again, please do um, comment down below and like the video if you found this useful. Um, and if you have any kind of queries at all, or if there's any questions that you're struggling with that you'd like me to do, you know, if you have any individual questions, just copy and paste them down below. And I'm happy to include them in a video if needs be. Okay, so thank you. Thank you very much for watching. Um, and I'll see you soon.